Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. On tonight's show, we'll have a story from Inside Energy. But first, Matt O'Lean talks with Bismarck designer, Sherry Esper. Coming up later on Prairie Pulse, we'll have an Inside Energy story from Wyoming. But first, our guest is Bismarck designer, Sherry Esper with CE Designs. Sherry, welcome to Prairie Pulse. Thank you for having me. First off, why don't you tell folks a little about yourself, your background, where you're from originally, and how you got into knitwear designing. I grew up in Bismarck and graduated from Bismarck High, and then I grad went to the University of Minnesota and lived in Minneapolis for 14 years. But I had a neighbor who taught me how to crochet when I was 10, and I loved crocheting forever. And even though I have a psych degree and a sociology degree, my, my passion is knitting, so I opened a yarn shop. Okay, so tell us about your company, when it started, how is it doing, and then you're going to show us some things pretty quickly. Okay, CE Designs is on at 417 East Broadway in Bismarck, and I opened on September 11th, 2008, and I sell my own knitwear designs. That's what I'm promoting right now. My business has grown. When I first opened the shop, my intention was to teach people how to knit and crochet, and I've accomplished that. I've got a lot of new knitters and crocheters up, and now I'm focusing on my knitwear design because that's my primary goal, and there's just not enough time to do everything, so you have to figure out what you're gonna focus on. And how is, has the business grown? Do you have people working for you? I don't. I'm, okay. I'm the only one wow. working there, and I really love it because it's my, it's my baby. And I work around, I've got a, I've got a dog that's, Elder, that's getting elderly, so my work hours are around him, but I'm there six hours a day, five days a week. Okay. And right now I'm working on an e-commerce. I'm setting up my website, cherryesper.com, with a shopping cart so that I'll be able to sell online because I know that's the way to go. Okay. Well, why don't you show us some of the things you've got here? Uh, we can see kind of a mannequin, of course, behind us, but um, yeah. and then show us some other things. The mannequin, my goal is to have a gown on the red carpet in the future, and the, the mannequin's wearing the blue dress that was made for a wedding in Glendale, California, and it is made with DMC number 10 thread, so it's made out of doily thread. It took several hundred hours to make, and I love it. I love making gowns, and I, I want to focus on gowns and handbags. The first publish, I'm publishing patterns in magazines and in hardcover books now and in the knitting calendar for 2015 this year also. But the first published pattern I ever had was the dread bag, which is okay, this one. I'm scared everything's going to yeah. fall over. Yep. This is a dread bag I mailed to Vogue Knitting in New York City on a Tuesday and they received it on Thursday. And the, the yarn editor called me and said it was traveling from office to office to office that they just loved it. And it was published in the Knit Simple magazine. And I've, that has really been a focal point, the dreads in what I do. I put them in shawls and scarves, and I've, I've been making wall hangings and different things. The pattern in the 2015 knitting calendar is actually this. I, in that, it was called the Biana bag, but I've changed this so it has a knit. That was, was knit on the top. This is crocheted. But I call it the Traveler because it's got the cover mm -hmm. that pulls down, so you don't have to worry about anyone getting into your bag. Um, I also have started working, this is a little, I figure this is a prom bag, a wedding party mm -hmm. bag. I actually made it for the blue sure. dress, but it's great, it carries, your, it carries your cell phone, your keys, your lipstick, some cash, so you're ready to go out. This is another bag, we all know about crocheted granny squares, we all have granny square blankets and stuff from when we were kids, Afghans. But this is a pattern I designed, made out of granny square, which I elongated and then did a different border. But everything I make is my own design. So these are, I, mm -hmm. a friend of mine helped me name them Wee Mocks, and they're little baby booties. So that's been a hit too at the shop. I've sold quite a few. I put them out right before Christmas and started selling them immediately. This is a little crocheted bag. That is from... Um, I, I love the pinks and the reds together, so I made it. It's for a night out on the town. And, you know, everybody likes a little specialty gift f for a party favor or when you're, someone has a birthday, and this is a wine woolly. So there's a bottle of wine inside that, and it's like a sock that you pull up over the, over the bottle of wine. And this is a scarf, and I use the shibori. It's a Japanese technique. And you knit the scarf, and it's really oversized. And this was made out of sock yarn, so it took many, many hours. Then you put little bo wooden balls in it, put a rubber band around it, and felt it in your washer. And you pull the balls out 
afterwards, but it's just a really unique piece, so mm -hmm. if you wear it, everybody sees it. And I'm wearing a, a hairpin lace shawl, which is a nice little cover-up too, and you can do multiple things with it. This one is actually, it's like a poncho that you can put over your head, but I'm wearing it as a shawl. And I also started making necklaces and little cuffs that ma match the necklaces. But I can, I've made pants and sweaters, I do. I do pretty much everything. And I'll, most of the things that I make, I'm just working on without a pattern. And I write patterns for s some of my pieces, but not for everything because there's not enough time. But I am submitting patterns to Vogue Knitting all the time. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine the work that went into this. I mean, a it's tremendous, just you. I can't, just tell us about that. It's a tremendous amount of work, but it's my passion. So, I mean, when I was taking my kids to school to practice when they were little, and I'd sat, sit in the car and I'd be knitting or crocheting while they were at practice. I've always, I've loved, like I said, I learned how to crochet when I was 10. I taught myself to knit 17 years ago. And I hadn't made any clothing until I had my son, who's now 25. And I, he had little sweaters and gowns, I mean, when he was a baby that I had crocheted. And I just realized that I can do it without patterns. So I was always working, like by ear, like musicians go by ear. That's what I do. So I've just, it's my passion. And I get home at night from work and I sit down and I knit. And has the company taken off, Sherry? Tell, tell us about that. Yeah, my comp a, lo a lot of people, they don't realize what you can do with knitwear and crocheting. I mean, we're in Bismarck, North Dakota. People aren't, um, a lot of people aren't into high fashion and they think spending 300 hours making right. a gown is just ridiculous, but that's what I do. So I'm bringing a new flavor to town. And tell them about the reaction of your clients, because you really focus on one-on-one -on -one interaction. I mean, tell us about some of the feedback, and do people come back, I assume, they second, do. third I times? Have, I have people that rotate. I get a group of new knitters in, they learn to knit, they come in and take several classes, and then they rotate out. And then I get a new group of people in. So I see for most of the people that come in are returns. Very rarely do I see someone who hasn't been in. But even my, I'm not on, there's, there are different places you can go and find, search out knitting patterns and crochet patterns. But I'm not online looking at that because I've got many ideas in my head. So I don't want to like contaminate my, my ideas with what's out there. So mm -hmm. when I have yarn reps come to my shop, they're just blown away because of what I have because they haven't seen it anywhere else. Now, you said it's all your own designs. How do you protect then that from other people copying? Copyright. You copyright okay. them. Okay. And when I have a pattern, I know that there are some pieces that I hold near and dear. When they publish my dread bag, they usually take your copyright, but okay. I didn't want them to. And they made a one-time, one-time, um, oh, what shall I call it, exception for sure. me. So I got my, they had my bag for a year and the copyright for a year, and then I have it back now. But like when I publish something in the calendars, the copyrights, they are not taken. But for most items, when you publish it, they get your copyright. So I pick and choose what I want to have published. I want to build my brand as a knitwear designer in, on paper with patterns. But my goal is to be working with stylists and to be just knitting or crocheting for people that are interested in knitwear and publishing patterns once in a while. But my focal point is really to get a gown on the red carpet. Mm -hmm. Now you teach classes as well. I do. And tell us how that goes and who well, takes them. And starting beginning knitters. And I just put something, I have a website, SherryEsper.com, and I have my classes listed and I update them every couple of months. It's time to update again. But I just put posted a, about a month ago that if you have someone, if you have a friend or a couple of friends that would like to take a class, you can just have a private class. So I've got a couple gals taking class tomorrow to learn how to make slow chats. So they just sign up online or they can call you? They just called me and okay. we did it right over the phone. Okay. Yeah. And um, was it difficult starting your own business? Take me back to that. That's scary, right? Well, I it, mean, it wasn't that scary for me, but my brother Kurt has his MBA from Pepperdine. And he told me finding the location was like number 50 on a list of 100 things you should do. And I was so excited and he burst my bubble immediately. <laughs> But so I just knew I wanted to do it and I had a passion for it and I was going to do it. And I've got the, a perfect little location downtown. Mm -hmm. And like right now, like I said, I'm promoting my e-commerce. I'm gonna set up my e-commerce site and I'm really f looking forward to that taking off. Why do people like knitwear, do you think? Well, I think With it's- the bags and the clothes, everything? I think, I think it's fashionable. And if you look in any InStyle magazine or Vogue Knitting, there is so much knitwear out there. And there always has been. 
but it like it's like I think it ebbs and flows. So in fashion, it ebbs and flows like in everything. But people like my pieces because if you come and buy a dread bag, no no one else is going to have it. I I had someone um, purchased a bag right away after my I was on North Dakota today a couple weeks ago and someone purchased a bag. But unless people see what you have, they don't know. Mm -hmm. And when I first opened my shop. My focal point was more on teaching knitting and stuff, and I did have my own designs in the shop. But I've been open for six and a half years, and my focus has changed now as I've gotten older and my kids have graduated from college. My goals are different. So now I'm really focusing on my own designs and selling my own designs and building my brand as a knitwear designer. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee expanding, hiring people at some point, or is it always going to be you? Well, it's always going to be me because my shop is really, I mean, it's my right. knitwear designs, and I don't want anybody else to be knitting and having their items in my shop. I, I want it to be Originals by Sherry Esper. But my kids have graduated from college, and they've got goals, and I do want to live near them in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm setting up my e-commerce, and at some point I'll move so that I can be near my kids. And you mentioned they're in film school out they're, in California. They've yeah. graduated. My son graduated from Cal State Long Beach in film, and my daughter graduated from USC in communications and film. Now, if you're out there, though, I, I remember we had someone on the show recently who, who was in California, came back to Moorhead, started a company, and it took off. Is it... You know, out there, there's so many people that do this, and here you're you're kind of the person. Is that a concern at well, some point, or will you be so established by then? Well, I'm hoping to be more established by then because a lot of my pieces, you know, I like to do things that are really unique and asymmetric, and a lot of people are, they're not ready to wear something that I make because my things are different. I mean, they're not the, the normal, typical thing that you wear in North Dakota. So... Um, I, I don't know, some people tell me I need to get into a bigger city. I'm told that quite often, that I need to get into a bigger city. And I'm just waiting to see where my kids end up. They have talked about moving to Minneapolis mm -hmm. for a little bit of time. So I'm waiting to see where they go because I, wanna, I don't wanna miss any more time with them. All right. I noticed on your website, you talked about Runway Art in Motion. Can you tell us what that is? The last three years in November, we've had a show at Bismarck Art and Galleries and I've had either 12 or 11 models each year, and they've modeled over 100 pieces of my of my designs. And it's a great night. Erica Landers has Northside Market at, at Landers Conoco here on State Street, and she's done the hors d'oeuvres the last couple of years, which have been tremendous. She's a young businesswoman, so it's nice to do this together. And it is just a fun night. Mm -hmm. And like how many models do you use? How do you get a hold of them? How does that work? Well, it's it's funny because the first year I had it, most of the models that modeled the first year wanted to model again and again. I mean, I can I have no trouble finding models. Even now when we're on shows, I've got a couple gals that are just great models and it's it's fun to have them model for me because they they love my my pieces as much as I do because they've been around me for several years and they've taken classes and they know how, all the work that goes into it. So it's fun having people that actually knit model because they realize what they're wearing. Mm -hmm. When you teach the classes, uh, are, are some people just taking them for the fun of it? Do they have goals for a profession like this or is it kind of a mixture? It's, it's, most people are just taking, taking it for a relaxation. I have a lot of business women that take it because there, it's been proven if you're always learning, you have a lesser chance of getting dementia. So I have a lot of people that come in and take Class that are older, younger, I mean, I've had high school students take classes. Everybody seems to enjoy it. And usually they come back and take a mitten class or a handbag class. We start out with the beginning. The beginning project is a scarf that's not, it's similar to this, but it's made with thicker thread. So it takes them, it, it's a couple hundred yards that they knit up. And we actually do the shibori technique. So their stitches, the fibers, as you can see, you can barely see stitch definition mm -hmm, here. Right. But you you don't see any here. So after they've knit up their scarf, when the when their stitches vary because they're just learning to knit, after they felted it, they look like professional knitters with their first item. So I've got I mean, it's it's fun. It's a variety of people that come in, and you learn about people's kids and their their lives and the sports and their pets because you just kind of bond after while you're teaching. Are women your primary clients, or do you get men? I too? did have a gentleman okay. who was in his mid seventies who came in to learn how to knit because he remembered his mother had knit, and he learned how to knit, and then he started making an afghan, and he came back a couple times, and then he came back and he said that he'd taken his afghan to show his sister who lived in Mandan, and she told him that his mother had crocheted, 
she had it knit. So she kind of pulled the rug out from an under him. It was kind of cute. But I have, um, I have another, there was another physician in town who, who came in and took the class. He was a psychiatrist and he came and took the class just as a downtime event, you know, to relax at the end of the day. And how about purchasing your items? Women primarily, the clients? Women primarily. I really focus on women. I mean, I do have men that have come in and asked me to make them a hat or, mm -hmm. or fingerless gloves or different things, something of theirs that has worn out. So I do, I can make men's things equally as well as women's, but I focus on women because they're more of the people that come in. The other thing, when I opened my shop, it looked more like a knit shop and, and there was more yarn. I always had yarn in the windows and stuff. And that scared the regular com customer from coming in because they thought it was just you had to be a knitter to come mm -hmm. in. So I'm trying to break that too because now I have only knitwear in the in the windows, and I'm changed. I've changed my focus on to my own designs and selling my designs and teaching classes based on my designs. So I'm trying to make people realize that you don't have to knit. You can come in and you can purchase a handbag or you can purchase wee mocks or you can take classes. You don't have to be scared to come in. So you kind of mentioned this, but the mannequin that we see here uh, with the dress, how many hours did it take you to make that dress? It took about 300 hours. Oof. And I actually, I made it, you can't see it floor length, but it is a floor length gown. And it was worn in Glendale, California to a wedding. Right. It was worn with the full length for, of the gown for the wedding and the reception, the bottom. I have a string that I can just pull and in five seconds, it's to your knee. So the lower portion with the Shaworsky crystals is pulled off for mm -hmm. the, so I, that's one of the unique things I do with my pieces too. I don't know if other people do that. And how about the purse? How long did the purse take? Well, I've, I've gotten really good at making the purse. It takes probably between 20, probably around 25 hours for me to make the bag. I have another gal, someone who took my class who was knitting it and she was not even, she hadn't even dreaded it yet. And she, she was just beginning to dread it and she was up to 40 hours. So it just depends on how much effort, but I'm, I'm, I tell people I'm not a machine, but I kind of am a machine because that's all I do and I, I enjoy it so much. And I think it's all about the process. I don't, I don't want, I like using small needles and fine yarn better. Some people say they like using really huge knitting needles because the, it goes quicker, but I enjoy the process of knitting and crocheting. What advice do you have for people that may, might want to go into this profession? Well, I think you have to follow your heart and the sky is the limit and you just can't give up. It's like anything, anything good you have to work for. Mm -hmm. uh, we just got about 30 seconds left. Again, if people want to buy your items, uh, teach, cl take classes, where are you located? What's your website? How can they find you? My website is SherryEsper.com and I'm located at 417 East Broadway. It's the old Wesley Jeweler location. They moved to the end of the block six and a half years ago and I took their mm -hmm. old old shop and it's it's a perfect location and it's Bismarck is really growing there are great new businesses down there so you have to come down I hear I hear all the time that I never come downtown well you have to come down and see what's downtown okay thanks Sherry for being on Prairie Pulse thank you for having me my guest has been Sherry Esper CE Designs in Bismarck stay tuned for more with the GOP takeover of the Senate and its leadership now stacked with anti-EPA lawmakers, the party now has the ability to block President Obama's clean power plant. And at the heart of that strategy is Wyoming's John Barrasso, who will serve as a Republican policy chairman. Wyoming is always at war with the EPA, and Barrasso is too, calling the agency extreme and accusing it of putting coal out of business. We'll look at what's at stake with the administration's attempt to clean up coal-fired power plants. Caring for a few hundred cows during a Wyoming winter is hard work. Sub-zero temperatures and hurricane force winds are normal. Rancher Dave Hamilton says it's part of the disconnect between people who live off the land and those who regulate the environment. We seem to have people that have never ever even set foot on, on in the state of Wyoming that don't understand farming, don't understand ranching, pass rules that affect us all when in fact, we all want to keep our land together. I mean, I can't make a living if I destroy my land. In 2010, the EPA sued Hamilton for building an irrigation ditch that it claimed violated the Clean Water Act. His lawyer says the agency was seeking hundreds of thousands of dollars in penalties. But when the case went to court, 
the jury ruled in Hamilton's favor because farming and ranching are generally exempt from the Clean Water Act. We don't want to have air like China, and we don't want to have water that has, that has so much benzene in it that all the fish are dead. But I think the problem is, is that if we would have interaction that creates solutions, where what we're having is, you can't do this, we don't know what you're going to do about it, but you can't do this because we're going to fine you. This is about protecting our health, and it is about protecting our homes. In June, EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy announced the Clean Power Plan. It's the agency's newest proposal to cut carbon emissions. All told, in 2030, when the states meet their final goals, our proposal will result in 30 percent less carbon pollution from the power sector across the United States in comparison to 2005 levels. People here in Wyoming care deeply about issues that affect their land and energy resources. And this plan is threatening because it aims to slash carbon emissions by 30 percent, in part by moving American electricity generation away from coal. And this hard black rock is Wyoming's lifeblood. Mineral extraction accounts for nearly 75 percent of the state's revenue, about a third coming from coal. It funds things like schools and road construction and a huge state savings account. Wyoming has a long history of coal mining, and these days the state provides nearly 40 percent of the nation's supply. But the top executive at this mine does acknowledge concerns about emissions from burning coal. Colin Marshall is the CEO of Cloud Peak Energy, one of the largest coal companies in the country. I believe the science is clearly not settled, but there's some theories out there. And if they're um, right, that CO2 emissions are significant, then they could you know, potentially could be very uh, a big impact on the world and its climate. And I always think, well, what happens if the impact of climate change are twice as bad as people are thinking? Marshall believes the answer is the technology shown here at the Boundary Dam Power Station, the world's first and only carbon capture power plant. Components like this absorber tower are bolted on and then remove the harmful CO2 right out of emissions. Let's develop the technology so if it's uh, appropriate to play that card, we've actually got, got the, uh, the technology we need. Boundary Dam opened in Canada last year, but installing this technology on a wide commercial scale is almost prohibitively expensive. And so coal country is fighting back against the clean power plan. In August, Wyoming, along with 11 other states, sued the EPA, hoping to derail the proposal. But this is just the latest chapter in a long history of conflict. Since the year 2000, the state has sued the EPA 12 times over issues like regional haze and mercury emissions. And that doesn't even include the lawsuits it's joined on behalf of other states. Professor Harold Bergman specializes in environmental toxicology. Wyoming can file 100 lawsuits a month if they want, and it's not going to change a thing. This is going to get fixed. It absolutely must. He says Wyoming lawmakers need to recognize the realities of a changing climate. The consequences for the coal industry, for instance, are, are going to be severe, and they have to begin adjusting for it now. If they don't, we're going to be blindsided. The sole U.S. House representative for the state of Wyoming does not share this sense of certainty. The climate is changing. The climate is always changing. Uh, and the science on mankind's role in the change of climate uh, is uh, simply not as well established as one would have us think. As the chair of a brand new subcommittee focused on energy and environmental policy, Lummis says she will work to gather information on how the EPA's policies affect people. She and her fellow legislator, Wyoming Senator John Barrasso, who chairs the Republican Policy Committee, believe the Clean Power Plan would result in job loss and higher utility bills. And so blocking it is a priority among Republicans and leadership positions. Lummis hints at their strategy here. We will have the power of the purse and can use it in a way that will allow us to send messages to the president that certain policies and rulemaking is having a negative impact on jobs 
and the economy, mostly in rural America and in energy producing areas of our country. At Jake's Tavern, a popular hangout in coal country, energy worker Brandon Alley says the issue is not so much about politics, but more about Wyoming's rugged, independent mentality. There's a lot of us around here that we've been here for generations. And the EPA coming in and telling us what we can and can't do, or making it really hard for us to do what needs to be done, just doesn't settle well with a lot of us. Wyoming exports more energy than any other state, so there's a lot on the line in the debate over the clean power plant. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Lee Patterson in Wyoming. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Inside Energy is a project of Prairie Public in cooperation with public broadcasters in Colorado and Wyoming. Funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. See more at insideenergy.org. And by the members of Prairie Public.